of um, one question. I mean, I, I kind of know the answer to this, but I'm assuming that other people might not. Um, is is there anyone from the families who are still alive that still think you did it other than Terry? There, there are. There's uh, one of one of the children's family members. Um, I think they're probably still in West Memphis. I haven't heard from them in years and years. So they kind of went underground. The reason why they're they're claiming that they won't do the DNA testing is that you don't have jurisdiction because you're no longer in prison, right? Right. So even the family members who think that you did it, uh, but especially the ones who don't, because they know a lot of them don't now, um, couldn't they request the DNA be tested? They could, but the state still wouldn't do it. You, know, it's, you would it, think that they would want to, even if even if you were guilty as all get out, you would think that they would want to just put the rumors to rest, just you know, once and for all, figure it out. Uh, if not for you, then for the families and for the community there, because um, they, you know, they might still have a killer living among them. <laughs> almost every single thing about this case defies common sense, logic, and reason. Sort of, except for the common sense that. Well, the state is implicated in this. Yes. That's, I mean, I often say uh, Occam's razor, in the absence of evidence, the solution that makes the least amount of assumptions tends to be correct. If you've got party A saying, do not investigate, stop, stop. And then you've got the accused being like, please, please investigate. This can exonerate me and it can prove I really did it. And then the other group says, nope, nope, nope. It's like, I'm kind of looking in your direction at who the guilty party might be. Yeah. I think it might implicate something with the state. As you mentioned, the police may be worse. What they're uh, used to doing, though, is they've kind of, through the years, sort of realized or seen that if we can just hold out long enough, something else will happen that will draw people's attention away, distract them, a new shiny object appears, and maybe this fades away and everybody forgets about it. So, no, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. So, I know under the Alfred plea, they did that entirely so that you can't see them, right? Um, but if they did find the like the real killer and they had DNA and it was proven beyond a reasonable doubt that you did not do it and that they had the person who did, could you? Would it nullify the Alfred plea in that case? Would you be able to sue them? That's one of the things that nobody knows for sure. Yeah, just I tried because to find the answer. There has couldn't. never been a situation like this before. You yeah. know, this is a first-time, unique, unprecedented situation. So it's almost impossible to say what could happen. I mean, in in a just world, it would. You know, in, in a just world, it would this situation would be rectified in a right. lot of ways. You know, somebody else would be sent to prison. The people who covered it up would be held accountable. We would be able to sue the state of Arkansas. You know, a lot of things would be fixed. But the the fact of the matter is nobody really knows. They're sort of making yeah. it up as they go along. Who would be able to make the call to get the test done? Is it only in the hands of like the state Supreme Court now or could like the governor, is Sarah Sanders is the I mean, governor it, now, could she step in? I don't know if she could or not, but I mean, she's the governor, so she could definitely, you know, look into it or mm -hmm. apply a little pressure or even, because there's a bunch of ways that it, this could happen. Like for example, the, the prosecutor, the attorney general, any of these people, the judge, any of these people have the ability to say at any point, do the DNA testing. All of them are trying to prevent it from being done. So she could theoretically like even ask the attorney general, why are you fighting this case? Right. And and that would put a little pressure because that's the only thing these people care about. Yeah. That's the only reason I'm, I'm, I even talk about this stuff is because the only thing they care about is a, sh a spotlight being shined on. Them. Yep. If there's if there's no scrutiny, then they say, what's the point? Exactly. If uh, it's like the old cost benefit and the cost risk analysis thing businesses do. You ever see Fight Club? Mm hmm. When he's on the when uh, Edward Norton's character's on the plane and the and he's talking to the guy and he says if the cost of the lawsuits are less than the cost of the recall we won't recall. Yes. So they would rather the cars crash and people die because that would be cheaper than actually recalling. So the state's looking at it like that. Yep. How much? How much? Mo what's our monetary damage? What's our political risk? Well, it's it's easier for the state. You have to wonder this: Why is it easier for the state to try and kill an innocent man? What, what are the repercussions for the state that's worse than killing an innocent person? There must be something really dark deep in there, and it may, must be someone very powerful that they're scared 
you know, of, of, of it coming out. That, w- and also keep in mind that a lot of these people built careers for themselves off of this case. You know, you had the judge went on to run for Senate and become a senator. The prosecutor runs for Arkansas Supreme Court. Like, you had a lot of people who used this as the foundation of showing, like, we're whatever it is that the, the reason you should vote for us is because we handled this case. Yeah, and this was the height of satanic panic, too. Yeah. So they were, you know, coming out looking like heroes mm-hmm. who, you know, stopped the satanic cult that was running rampant. In it's like some teenager who drew some goofy pictures and they're, yep. Yeah, but, so great. but it, it was all over the TV back then. I mean, you had like all the talk shows, everybody, everybody was talking about the satanic panic, which I remember very vividly because I had just discovered, you know, the misfits, Marilyn Manson, I'm like 12 <laughs> and I'm just like, oh great, there's Columbine and satanic panic and all this stuff. It was not a good time for me. <laughs> there was, there's a, a lot of kids. There's a. You ever hear of Magic: The Gathering, the card game? Mm-hmm. They had a, a one of the cards in the early sets. This is like '94. Was called Unholy Strength, and it's a the art is a man who's like head tilted up, and behind him is a burning pentagram. And when they reissued the set, they had to remove the pentagram because I guess parents were complaining about the satanic imagery or, of it or whatever. Mm-hmm. So like this is you know, a few years later I, even, and people are still very much. No, it's offensive. We can't show kids this evil imagery and you have to get it from the art and get it out of there. Yeah. Eddie Munson's character on Stranger Things was based out on yep. you, right? Yep. <laughs> wow. My daughter's yeah. obsessed with him. Yeah. So <laughs> I was telling her that I was going to go meet the person that he was based on. She thought that was very cool. <laughs> have, have you ever seen the movie The Life of David Gale? I've heard the name, but it doesn't ring a bell. I don't, I don't know if it, you know, you said you were on death row for 18 years. So I don't know if there's something, something you want to watch, but it's the movie, of, it's a Kevin Spacey film, which, you know, the context of that kind of changes now that Kevin Spacey has been accused of all these things. But in the film, he is a uh, philosophy professor who goes to a party one night and there's this uh, young, w- young woman who basically flunks out of the college and no longer is a student and they have sex. She stages it as a rape, then falsely accuses him and then flees and drops the charges. He loses his e- everything. And then that's the backstory, but the, 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 the story starts with him on death row. Mm. He's giving an interview. Another teacher he had worked with was raped and murdered. And so I don't wanna, I don't wanna ruin the movie, but I guess I will, cause it's like a 20 year old movie. Basically what happens is he's an anti-death penalty activist, him and this woman. His life is destroyed by this false rape accusation. Then one day this woman is found with a bag over her head. Her hands are cuffed behind her back. She's got, you know, his fluids in her. The key to the handcuffs, they're in her stomach. And she's dead from asphyxiation with the, you know, the bag taped to her neck. He gets accused of it. He gets sentenced to death. And then in the end, he gets put to death. And then after he dies, a video gets sent anonymously. Or or no, a a reporter finds a video of her committing suicide. Of her swallowing. Cuffing herself, swallowing, you know, swallowing the key. She tapes the thing around her neck, and then she cuffs herself and lays down. And then he gets put to death falsely, mm. causing this panic and everything. I just think it's, it's a, I don't know. I, 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 I'm just reminded of, a, of that movie, I suppose, thinking about your case and you know, being on death row for so long, innocently. I guess there's no point to tell that story about the movie other than I, I think it's a really great movie. And I'm just wondering... Uh, you know, what, what, what was going through your mind when they, they convict you? When, when you got convicted, they immediately say that they were seeking the death penalty? Oh, yeah. I, I, I believe they even said it before, before the trial. I mean, we knew, I mean, they were charging me with capital murder. And there's all, there were only two penalties in Arkansas for capital murder. Either you get life without parole or you get the death penalty. And I was the main one that they were gunning for. So we knew going into that into that courtroom that they were going to try to give me the death penalty. When, um, so the jury deliberates and I think it was a a relatively short deliberation or was it? I can't remember. It wasn't very long. I can't remember exactly how long it was, but I know it was, it was like less than 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, what, what was going through your mind when, you know, they come back in and, you know, it's, it's weird. Like talking about that in, in, in a lot of ways is very, very difficult just because looking back on that time, it's almost like trying to remember somebody else's memories. Like I'm not that person anymore. Like so much time has passed and, and so many different experiences that it, it changes you. So what I remember from that time period is part of you knows that you're screwed, 
But part of you also keeps thinking, surely at any minute somebody's going to fix this. You know, surely somebody's going to come to their senses at any time. Surely an adult is going to come into the room and put an end to this. So there's part of you that knows that you're screwed and part of you that still has this like clinging to hope that somehow, some way, this is going to turn out okay. And I think a lot of people keep doing that all the way up until the point that they're executed. Wow. 